Welcome. Uh, this is a Bridge USA event in partnership with Free Intelligent Conversation and Heterodox Academy. Uh, this is a Q&A slash AMA with John Haidt. Uh, the idea here is I know everyone's been at home and we both all these organizations came together and we're looking for ways to continue to engage people despite uh, being at home and, and looking to uh, uh, engage in, in meaningful conversations and good dialogue. So that was kind of the impetus for this event and that's what brought us here. Um, give me, oh, Ross, I got one People are, I have a couple people message me saying they can't find the Facebook link. So it's the live link to join. So uh, I don't know if there's anything missing there, but I figure I flag that. So I can see it. Cool. So to get, before we get started, I figured it might be most useful to begin by introducing the organizations represented, um, starting with uh, Bridge USA. And to introduce Bridge USA, we're going to have Emily Garcia from uh, president of ASU chapter of Bridge USA and national director of youth development. So please, uh, Emily, go ahead and introduce yourself and introduce uh, what Bridge USA is. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, introduction Kyle. Um, my name is Emily Garcia and I am currently the president elect for Bridge USA at Arizona State University, and I also serve for the national branch as the National Director of Youth Development. Um, and on behalf of Bridge USA, I would just like to thank Free IC, Heterodox Academy, and Jonathan Haidt for just or putting on this conversation for all of us to just exchange views on a national level. We're so appreciative of this opportunity. Um, Bridge USA is creating a movement of students who rise above polarization to build a more vibrant and unified democracy. In order to achieve this, we attack destructive political culture at both the grassroots and institutional level. In terms of grassroots, we create chapters on college campuses that advocate advocate for viewpoint diversity, responsible discourse, and solution-oriented politics. We then use that support to lobby decision makers within the university to accelerate policies aimed at creating a more open and inquisitive learning environment. Finally, we provide professional development opportunities so that our students can apply the Bridge USA principles practically off campus as well. So, and thank you again. Wonderful. Um, the next organization represented here is free intelligent conversation and I promise I will not have as good as the description as Emily just shared but uh, free intelligent conversation is a nonprofit organization that is concerned with uh, creating meaningful conversations in public spaces I am I happen to be the founder of free intelligent conversation and the, the problem I was solving for is that I had a handful of, me and a handful of friends were looking for ways to engage in meaningful conversations with people, and we just couldn't find a place that publicly facilitated that interaction. Like my friends were going to parties, bars, clubs, bookstores, et cetera, and all of those, like people go there uh, for another reason and you hope a conversation happens. And I was asking the question of like, where do the people who just want a conversation go? So I had this crazy idea of me, I'd stand outside in the middle of a, a, a uh, city and hold this sign that said free intelligent conversation inviting people to stop and talk about anything and the idea was that an intelligent conversation would be learning from whom you're speaking with so when people stop and ask what i just told them i was there to learn from them uh since then um we have grown into an organization where we've had thousands of volunteers uh lead and join hundreds of events across 30 countries around the globe um just continuing to spread our mission uh there seems to be uh, a, a, a group of people like myself who are interested and looking for ways to create conversation in their, in their community and free intelligent conversation has been a great tool for them. So that is free I see. Next organization is Heterodox Academy and I will kick it to Daniel to go ahead and introduce that. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Daniel Coas. I'm the event planner at Heterodox Academy. Um, if you're not familiar with Heterodox Academy, we are a group of nearly 4,000 college professors, administrators, graduate students, um, 
people working in higher ed in all different ways. Um, and we have three main things that we strive for. We aim to improve the quality of both teaching and learning by pushing for open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. Um, a lot of shared uh, values, obviously, with Bridge USA and, and Free IC, and we are so thrilled to be here with you guys. Thank you for having us. Um, yeah, kick it back over to you, Kyle. Excellent. Okay, so let me introduce uh, John Height, who is our, our speaker here. Uh, John is a social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at NYU Stern School of Business. His academic specialization is in psychology of morality and moral emotions. Uh, Height is the author of three books, The Happiness Hypothesis, or Ra The Righteous Mind, and most recently, The Coddling of the American Mind. The last two books became New York Times bestseller. Height was named one of the top global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine and one of the top world thinkers by Prospect Magazine. Uh, John, excited to have you here. Thank you for joining. Oh, my pleasure, Kyle. Uh, I've, what a what a great group of group of groups. Um, you know, as 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 some of you know, I've been talking about um, how how uh, Generation Z is overprotected and and adults have done too much to to limit you and to constrain you. And so I was just looking back, you know, preparing for this and realizing, um, I guess I first met you, Kyle, uh, uh, about two years ago, um, to find out what you were doing. Uh, it just blew my mind. It was just, it was wonderful. And then um, uh, I guess I met Roj, uh, uh, Roj Karma about ex almost exactly three years ago today um, when he was founding Bridge USA. So it's, this is really fun for me to, to see what, what your generation is actually doing about this problem. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to get some things uh, out the way, right? So straight from the jump, I've told John that I want this to be more of a conversation, more than a presentation or a lecture, right? So feel free to ask any questions that you want to ask uh, John. Um, also, uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to, in terms of structure, we're going to ask six questions. Three of them will be COVID related. Three of them will be uh, learning about John the person. Uh, my goal here is not only to have a conversation with John Hype, the academic, but also John Hype, the person. So, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, in the name of that, I'm going to ask the first question. And John, my first question for you is, uh, what is the most expensive thing you've ever stolen? The most extensive thing I've ever stolen. Oh man! And here I'm an ethics professor, <laughs> and um, and this is being recorded. So I guess I better be careful. Um, I, I, gosh, I, um, I mean, the, when I think back to my shoplifting days, of which there were only about four or five, um, I've always, I've always been really easily like shamed, and I get nervous when I, you know, things like that. So I remember stealing like records in the '70s. You'd buy records, and they seemed expensive at the time. So there was, I once took one out of the sleeve as though I was looking at it to make sure it wasn't scratched, and then I slipped it in to another one. Uh, and so I paid for the one and I got two. That's the only one that comes to mind. Now, there are surely thefts of service that I've done that were like 100 times more than that, but nothing comes to mind. And that and that's what after the, the shame and guilt of that is what kicked off your your career as an ethical professor, I'm sure. Yeah, actually, I could even think, you know, it's funny, I was just thinking of one. Um, because I, I have kids and, you know, they leave money around and it, their money around. And I, it occurred to me, like, hey, I wonder if they ever steal each other's money. And I remembered what my first time stealing when my, my friend, I was like seven years old, and my friend showed me how to steal. You just go into your mother's purse, you open, you just open it up, and you take the money and she doesn't know. And so I tried that on my sister, my younger sister, and she had a $5 bill and I stole it. And she was crying and I felt so horrible, but I couldn't admit it. And I, I, I did finally admit it to her when we were adults. <laughs> okay, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful answer. Um, uh, moving to the next question on uh, COVID related. Um, uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the psychological impact you think that an event like COVID-19 has on students. Yeah, that, so there's a lot, there's a lot, okay, this is going to have a lot of impacts on, on individuals, on children, on schools, on our democracy. Um, it's going to have a lot of impacts, but it's, it's kind of hard to predict. You could tell a story either way. And so 
here's the hopeful story. Here's the one that I, I think is going to be true for a lot of young people, um, which is that uh, because we're all anti-fragile, I you know some of you heard me talk about this ad nauseum, um, because we all need um, we all need adversity in order to grow. I'll, actually, I'll just share. I just learned this fairly recently. Um, trees are anti-fragile when they did the biosphere. The uh, was it called the biodome, the, this like thing they did in the 90s to see if people could live in an enclosed space. They grew trees inside and the trees would grow fast, but then they actually fell over before they reached adulthood because it turns out trees need wind. The wind blows them over and then the roots get stronger and the, uh, the, the structural supports get stronger where it's needed. Um, anyway, Gen Z was so protected, your, your parents, um, generally thought that it would be bad for you if you heard nursery rhymes that had death in them. I mean, everything bad has been stripped from your childhood. So um, to be come face to face with a pandemic where people are dying, where your future is not as, 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 as so assured, um, in the long run probably will be good for most people. Um, we need adversity in youth. And so um, this will probably help psychologically. The rates of depression and anxiety are so high for Gen Z. Um, that this, this could be a strengthening. Now, on the other hand, it depends on what's happening in your family. So if your parents are freaking out, um, or if you have anxiety disorders and things are happening that make you more anxious, well, then it, it could push you over into not quite PTSD, but it could be long-term stress that actually does damage your brain. So uh, I don't know which effect is going to predominate. I don't know which will be more common, but there are going to be a lot of effects. Okay, the second question, or the third question I have for you here, John, is what, if anything, is too serious to be joked about? Oh, man. What is too serious to be joked about? Um, I guess I would say that there is no, okay, given that when I was growing up, there was a, a musical group called the Dead Kennedys, um, and um, people would tell you know, Holocaust jokes and, and all sorts of things. I guess I would say that there is no topic under the sun that cannot eventually be joked about. But I also do believe that there are things that are sacred. And by that, I mean, like, just like psychologically, like, like, um, right, you know, like after, right after there's a national tragedy, it, it's, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Durkheimian. I, I, I love this sociologist, Emil Durkheim. So there are times when we're all coming together and something is sacred. And if you make a joke at that moment, like joking about 9-11 on 9-12, you know, that is just incredibly insensitive. Um, but, um, you know, someday I'm sure kids will tell 9-11 jokes. Great answer. So then back to COVID-19, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, the impact on the coming election. Uh, how do you think, uh, how do you think Gen Z should be thinking about it? How do you think they will think about it? How do you think the other generations think about it as well? Yeah, well, let's see. Oh, gosh, I haven't thought about it in terms of generations. I mean, the, you know, in general, um, a, a shared cr a national crisis or emergency pulls people together and it gives a leader a bump. And in many countries, leaders have gotten a big bump. Trump only got a couple of points and then that's gone now. Our country is so polarized. <clears throat> um, so I guess I would, I, would, I would look at it like this. Um, the older generations, we really messed things up. We messed up the budget. We messed up global warming. We messed up the democracy and we're passing it off to you. Now we're stuck in our ways. We're stuck in our polarized ways. Um, and I I'm hopeful that at a certain point, people get exhausted, especially with the, the fights of the older generation. So I'm hopeful that, um, especially if things get really bad, which is possible, if things get really bad, either economically or socially, um, that Gen Z and millennials will react kind of the way the Europeans did after the you know hundred, hundreds of years of war over religion, which is, we got to just stop this. This is just crazy. This is exhausting. This is stupid. So um, uh, I'm sure this will have a lot of effects on the election itself. Um, I hope that I hope that the younger generations will realize you're fighting. It's like you're playing a game or fighting a battle on a ship that's sinking, and it's a certain point you got to stop fighting each other 
and say, okay, we have to have politics. There is a game there, but we also got to fix the ship. So uh, that's, that's what I hope, that's the effect I hope this will have on, on your generation. Good answer. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask uh, another free IC question here. And the question is, John, if a crystal ball could tell you the truth about yourself, your life, the future, or anything else, what would you want to know? Oh man, I guess right now I'd want to know the true, um, um, the true antibody rate in the United States and in New York City. Um, uh, no, I guess we just got some numbers about that today, which are which look pretty good, um, meaning a high number, which is what you want want to see. No, but that's a t that is an incredibly tough question because, of course. I'd love to know the future so that I could um, invest my money in ways that would make billions of dollars, which would allow me to endow every possible cause that I could ever want to endow. But that's a cheap, stupid answer. <laughs> I, you know, that's, I'm, as you ask me that question, I'm feeling like a little bit of fear because part of me says, you know, I want to know, like, when will I die? Like, no, I don't want to know that. So, man, is that a good question? And man, is this a bad answer? I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Okay, 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 okay. We'll let you off the hook there. Um, let me come back to COVID uh, one more time. Um, what do you think, how do you think this will uh, change the demand on future leaders, an event like this? Well, you know, democracies are strange things because, uh, you know, you said demand on future leaders. It's almost as though it's like a market. And it, one thing I've learned being in a business school is that, is that the world of business behaves a lot like the world of nature and evolution with you know, uh, you know, variation and selection and what works gets more common. But the world of politics and bureaucracy doesn't work anything like that. And that's how we can get bad leaders. Um, that's how countries can descend into polarization cycles that destroy them. So what effect will it have on future leaders? Oh, I can, okay, here's, here's one. Uh, there was an interesting article in Bloomberg today about how governments governments must play a central role as risk protectors. Democracies are really bad at thinking, uh, preparing for future risks. The people don't vote for people to spend money to, you know, spend about avoiding some risk that might never happen. So governments need to just do it anyway, even though the people aren't demanding it. And so I'm hopeful that... Um, that there will be more a sense that the government has to manage risk and handle some big things that markets can't handle. Um, this is where I think the left-right debate is most productive because if you let the right run everything, it'll have predictable blind spots and errors. And if you let the left run everything, same thing. So you have to have this nice tension between, uh, between those who want more and less government, but then you have to break out of just the more or less. And you have to say, well, no, what is it that only government can do it. What is it the government can do better than, than markets? Great answer. I have one free IC question before I open it up to the room. So uh, if anyone has questions, please be prepared to ask them soon. Uh, my question for you, John, is what is something someone said that forever changed the way you think? Oh boy, so, something someone said that forever changed the way I think. There are lots of stories I can tell um, and some are just purely intellectual. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be as interesting. Um, While you think of that, I have a good one from my mother. Um, okay, you go. My mother, one, my mother one time told me, she said, Kyle, I have to love you. I don't have to like you. And I was like, I was so young and it just shattered my mind because I was like, wow, I want my mom to love me and like me, right? Um, uh. Yeah, but that's sort of, you know, that's like, were, were, you, were you 12, 13, or 14 at the time? I was probably like 14, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's, you know, kids are, kids are lovable, adult children are lovable. It was a temporary thing. Um, let's see, what can I get off the hook here? Because I'm not thinking... Even if it's intellectual. Yeah, let's see. Something someone said, I mean, there's so many books I can point to that where I was like jumping up and down, like feeling my mind change. Um, and I'm sure that happened in lectures too, in college. That's part of what I look back on so fondly about, about college. But you're asking me like a moment, and that would be really cool to have like an epiphany moment from something someone said. 
or uh -huh. even if there's something from your lectures or book that stand out that you can think that, that was give that was one of these jumping up and down moments um oh man this is such a good question and nothing's coming to mind uh, just give me a few more minutes i'll i'll by the end of the hour i'll try to come up with something okay so we want to open it up to the floor for anyone who has a question um, how we're going to do this, I think, given the room size, I think we can manage. I want to have you unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask your question, and we'll go uh, that way for now. Oh, yeah, we can do gallery view. There's, there's, there's uh, not too many people that we can actually do gallery view and see everybody. Yeah. Or we can use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Uh, Justin Hayward. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, hear, hear you well. Awesome. Hi, my name is Justin Haywood. Uh, I am a senior about to graduate at Arizona State University, um, and I'm the outgoing president of Bridge ASU. Um, but my question I have for you, and, and I know we're with a, a number of organizations that are kind of doing work in this space, um, but I just finished my, my undergraduate thesis um, actually using your survey, the campus expression survey and I oh good yeah I got a, about 100 or 450 students at ASU to fill it out um, and ASU is pretty well off in terms of free speech um, we've adopted the Chicago principles we have a number of heterodox academy professors um, and we even have a chapter of bridging ASU um, but I was dismayed to find that we actually were pretty I know there's been studies done at UNC um, as well as other colleges. And when I was comparing sort of the, the level of reluctance sharing your views in, in classrooms, it remained relatively the same across, across other universities um, with, with a lot worse policies and, and procedures. So I was wondering if you think that the, the state of free speech on college campuses is getting better or worse and what policies per se should we implement to to kind of stave those off. Okay, no, great question. First, tell me, so you're saying the mean, so for those who don't know, the Campus Expression Survey is something we created at Heterodox Academy. Sean Stevens and I did the initial draft with some other HXA members. And the idea was to, f to ask a bunch of questions that would be able to allow us to assess who was afraid of speaking up about which topics, like race, gender, religion, politics, um, and why, what are they afraid of? Because we needed, you know, because there's all this talk about this, you know, speech crisis on campus. But we were academics. We said, well, let's let's have data, not anecdotes. So that's that's what that is. Um, so if you're telling me that the means, the reluctance to speak up in a seminar class, are similar to what you see at other schools. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Next, tell me about the left-right divide, or male-female, or black-white. Because one of the most important things with the campus expression survey is who is afraid to speak up. And while we created it because we had the, you know, we were hearing reports that people on the right, or even well, people on the right were saying, "I'm afraid to talk about things," and people on the left are saying, "Oh no, I can speak up." I mean, that was the thing we created to measure specifically, but we also put in, we also wanted to look at, you know, if if it's the case that men are feel free to speak up and women don't, or whites feel free to speak up and African-Americans don't. Well, that's really bad too. So tell me about your discrepancies. Did you, um, did you find any of those differences? Yeah, so we found that men were typically um, more uncomfortable sharing their views. Um, at least we, we modified it just due to survey length. We, we cut out some of the, the main topic issues, um, but for controversial issues on politics, um, men typically were more unlikely to share their views than females. Um, and then for race, um, it, our data, unfortunately, it was our sample sizes were, were pretty small, so it was hard to kind of extrapolate mm -hmm. too much. But um, for African Americans, it, they were typically a lot more uncomfortable than um, white students, as well as um, Hispanic and Latino students were, were also more more reluctant to speak. Okay, well, good. I mean, I'm glad to hear that at least the, the tool was useful and it points to you. And, and it, were you able to share this with administrators or professors? Because that's the sort of data that they need to know and they probably don't know. Yeah, and that's actually how we co collected our samples. We sent it out to every uh, hundreds of professors trying to get some more data on it. Um, and a lot of them wanted, they thought it would be informational for, for how they, you know, lectured or just important right. for that, so. 
Okay, good. No, okay, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so is the state on campus getting better or worse? Um, I, I don't know the, I, I can't say that, I don't know the trends for sure. The, uh, we don't have um, good data on free speech from before 2015. In 2015, beginning at Yale, you know, the, the, everything blew up and that's when we, you know, I, we found that Heterox Academy um, right around then as well. And um, there's a lot of data that begins around 2016, 2017, like Knight Foundation and Gallup, but nothing goes back before then. Uh, the trend since then, what I've seen is, is sometimes a little up, sometimes a little down, but not, you know, not like getting much better, not, not getting much worse. So that's all I know about the national, what little national data I've seen. Part of what might be going on is that more than ever before in history, um, uh, young people are having the same experience wherever they are. And so to some extent, because life on social media um, is often similar and because news is nationalized. So regional differences that uh, you might've expected, I, I think they're still there. I'm sure they're still there to some extent, but they might be less than in the past. Um, what did people say they were afraid of? That's the for next thing to look at. Where they, they use the question is usually are they more afraid of the that professors will give them a bad grade or criticize them, or are they more afraid of other students? We found largely along your um, other studies findings that they were more afraid of students rather than professors. Yeah, that's what we always find actually. Um, so this is really sad, and especially so. Look, as you know. Uh, those of you who are in Bridge or, or in Free IC, most people, most pe young people, most Gen Z, most millennials, most people are pretty reasonable and enjoy having conversations. And some of you know about the Hidden Tribes study, this wonderful study done by More in Common, breaks America into seven, they use a bunch of questions, seven different, from cluster analysis, they find seven different groups of people. Um, the two extreme groups are the ones that are really intimidating everyone. Um, but most people are in the exhausted majority. So um, if it's true that, you, you're, that ASU students are mostly afraid of each other, well, that's all the more reason why um, Bridge and other groups can be so effective. There's a strategy in psychology, what's it called now, where people, it was done in like the 70s and 80s when it was, you know, people drank a lot. Um, maybe, maybe they still do, but it was um, in which people assumed that everybody is drinking, but in fact, most people aren't getting drunk every week. And so just making the norms clear, like people are miss, you know, people might be assuming that they'll be jumped on. They may be assuming that most people have these attitudes and they don't realize, actually, no, most people want to have a conversation if you do it right. So I would, you know, I, I think um, um, ASU is about as hospitable a university as you're going to find. It is, uh, Deb Mashek and I wrote an essay on the on 10 schools that we know are, are at least doing a good job in terms of leadership. Um, and so, um, yeah, you got your work cut out for you. Um, and I would say just ramp up, just, you know, more programs, bring in more people and be, make it really visible that you, this is the norm, not freaking out about what somebody said. Ooh. Thank you. Move to the next question here. Uh, Sam Fuller. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. Oh, Sam. Exactly right. Yeah. Hi, John. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, uh, nice to yeah. see you. Yeah. Nice to see you too. Um, so I am the founder and outgoing president of Bridge URI, um, University of Rhode Island. And um, as you know, a couple years back, I interned with the Foundation for Individual, Individual Rights and in Education. Great internship. Um, really launched me into this sphere, which has been uh, quite a, a blessing, uh, the other side of the coin of, I think, uh, proper First Amendment advocacy. Um, so I have a question that has more to do with kind of the constitutionality of um, the righteous mind uh, thesis. So I'm doing my honors uh, project right now on um, what I'm terming uh, the problem of asymmetry. So the Establishment Clause has been interpreted by the Supreme Court um, to prohibit public educators uh, from advancing their religious um, beliefs mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the Establishment Clause only applies to religion and not politics and not ideology. But the language that the court uses, according to my analysis of the rulings uh, that the Supreme Court has um, has taken, in, has taken up and ruled on the matter of uh, establishment clause in public schools um, really resembles the fact that there's no meaningful difference between why 
politics and ideology and religion should not be advanced in a public educational setting. And so I'm wondering if you think that it would be proper for some body of government, government whether it's uh, the Supreme Court, whether it is um, uh, education committees, whether it's the state, to resolve this problem of asymmetry and prohibit public educators from advancing or denigrating their uh, political views, ideological views in the classroom as well. What implications this mm. might have on constructive dialogue? What implications this might have on the um, students feeling like they are uh, in a, feeling comfortable to share their views yeah. in a constructive manner? Um, mm. And uh, other things as well. How, does this, how would that affect that? Do you support such legislation? Yeah, that's an interesting strategy because um, yes, we do have this, we do treat religion as something special and different. And I believe, I'm not an historian, but I believe that is a result specifically of those wars of religion that Europeans decided, not because they were so tolerant and loving, but they were just so exhausted. They just said, okay, look, we got to stop, you know, we got to just not fight over religion. And maybe we'll get there someday over politics. Um, but I, I think what you're suggesting is that that we would treat political speech, uh, um, we would put limits on political speech in various contexts, equating it with re religious speech as though it was the establishment of a state religion. That strikes me as a very risky strategy, one that would raise a lot of red flags among libertarians and I would guess people at fire, I don't know. I would suggest a different approach. Um, I would suggest appealing more towards norms of professional responsibility and maybe even something akin to fiduciary duty. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by that is that, um, so you know, I, now that I teach in the business school, I teach our basic course in professional responsibility, and I kind of look over at like doctors and lawyers who have guilds and, and an oath, and you know, they, they can really have a guild um, and they can expel people. And in business, you can't do that. Well, academics kind of, ha we have a guild and we have high, high norms and we have a noble purpose. So we, we should be able to function like that. <clears throat> and if you think about it this way, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor. And if I, if I assign my books because I want to make money off of my students, and that's the only reason I assign my books, I should be fired. Because for me to exploit my students for my financial benefit is, is, is an incredible violation of my professional identity and responsibility and guild. Or if I were to uh, you know, admit students to my class or do things in order to seduce the ones I was attracted to, I should be fired on the spot. That would be an abuse of my authority. Uh, that would be violating my duty to educate and, and to care for my students in terms of their education. So that's unthinkable you'd be fired on the spot. Well, what if I were to recruit my students for my political projects? I'm very concerned about, you know, the far left or the far right or, you know, the rainforest or taxes, anything. If I was to teach my courses so as to bring my students uh, to help have them help me in my political projects, I should be fired on the spot. At least that's the argument, that's the argument I th think might be a better argument for you. That's one that I'm, I'm thinking of trying to develop um, because that happens all the time. And to appeal to a notion of professional, uh, professionalism, I think it raises many fewer red flags. It, it's uplifting rather than sort of like, I'm gonna use the constitution to beat you up. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would go that way. And if you look, I think it's the teacher's guild or something, there's some there's some code of ethics that high school or you know k through 12 teachers have that says very explicitly that they must not proselytize they must not you know use their you know you uh, um, use talk about politics or get their students so that's often already in there that's that's the way i would go hey i'm going to i'm going to chime in real quickly here i know that we have some people watching on the facebook live stream uh, if you guys have any questions feel free to drop them in there. Um, uh, we will ask those as well. I'm actually gonna take about like two or three of them for you, John, here. Uh, we have okay. a question from Jacob Wu. And the question is, do you think when all of this is over, campus atmosphere will be more polarized than before or less polarized? Hmm. 
And by this, I assume you mean the COVID crisis. I think that's what is. Uh, yeah. That's one of those th questions where it really could go either way. Um, if you asked me this a week or two ago, uh, I was generally optimistic. Um, I think this is going to push a lot of reset buttons and um, people are going to be, this is going to force us all to stop taking things for granted. Um, and, you know, like my kids are going to actually love going back to school whenever they can. Like there's all sorts of things we're just going to be so glad to be able to do. So in general, I would predict good things to come from this. And I think in a lot of other countries, it will be mostly good. Now, once we now have these lockdown protests, the anti-lockdown protests, and, um, you know, I'll, I, you know I, okay, okay, we can talk about politics here as long as we understand it's not, there's no malice. I mean, when, you know, when, when Donald Trump tweeted, um, liberate Virginia, liberate Minnesota, um, you know, I rarely criticize him in public. I, I don't just, you know, I, I only speak up if I think he's really done something that especially impacts like the areas that I study and care about. And since polarization is one of them, to, to make the response to the virus, you know, a, a, a political litmus test I thought was, was very bad leadership. So now that the response to the virus itself is a marker of your political identity, I'm much less hopeful. Um, now that's true for the nation at large. Will that play out on college campuses the same way? That I don't know. Um, I do think um, our just our vast democracy is just ripe for fighting. But on a college campus, you have a real chance to have an, a superordinate identity. And this is like social psych 101. Um, the superordinate identity, if the more you emphasize that, the more you can handle difference within, grow from it, and actually like people. So I'm hopeful that good leaders, um, both at the administrative level on campus and also student leaders, are going to really ramp up the, the, the in-group identity of the university or the college. Uh, because that's one, it's not exclusive. It doesn't, it's not like us versus them. It's, it really is a, like a draw a larger circle around it. So with good leadership, I think probably the effects will be beneficial. My guess is a lot of the identity politics stuff that, you know, it seems as though there's, you know, fighting over ever smaller transgressions. Um, that, I, th I haven't seen as much of that on Twitter recently. A lot of people have commented on this. So um, I, I think we might have, we, we might have, um, our arguments might be about uh, more like larger policy issues, which, which would be refreshing. Cool. I have another question for you from uh, Joe Guarneri, I believe. The question is, mental health issues in adolescents and specifically college students have risen in the last few years. Mm -hmm. The pandemic is likely to exacerbate this. Yet universities are tightening their budgets, meaning they won't be able to hire additional mental health counselors. Could this cause a crisis of some sort? So again, that's one of the things that could go either way. Um, it's for those who already have anxiety issues and if they're sequestered alone, um, there are certainly, uh, I, I, don't, I have not seen any data on whether mental health is getting better or worse um, because normally what happens when, you know, um, uh, what's long been known is if you try to bomb people into submission from airplanes, suicides go down, um, depression does not go up, it goes down. Um, crises tend to bring people together. Depression is not, oh, my future looks dark. Depression is much more, I'm alone and nobody loves me. And so if people are quarantined in certain ways, yes, there are surely a lot of people whose mental health issues are, are getting worse. But it's possible, it's quite possible that on average, college students' um, anxiety and depression levels are down. I, I don't know that that's the case. Uh, we, we, we need to be looking out for data. So I would just say, um, we, we can't make assumptions here. We do, we do need to get data. And it's, I think the effects are gonna be very mixed. Um, there is, um, there's a famous study, I need to read it again. I read it long, long ago called Children of the Great Depression. And the general find it's what, about kids who were, you know, when the Great Depression, it would happen. And people who were in their thirties when the depression hit often were broken by it. But if, if crisis or tragedy or bad things happen in your teens and twenties, 
that's the best age to grow from. That is the, that's where you get the most growth effects. So I think there can be lots of different courses through this. I don't, I, uh, it, it could be that, that rates, look, rates of depression and anxiety have been going up so fast. I, I, well, maybe I'll pull up some graphs. They're in my books. Oh, if you go to thecoddling.com and you click on solutions, better mental health, I've got lit reviews showing. It's unbelievable what has happened since 2012 to, to not just in America, it's in Canada, UK, uh, a lot of other countries. So, um, you know, I might say things couldn't get much worse. They can always get worse. But it is possible that actually rates will begin to come down once we get through the, the rough part. That they'll, re like, like they'll come down like lower than they were over the last few years. That's possible. Got it. We have another question from someone in here, uh, Ross Irwin. So I'll let Ross unmute himself and ask. Hello. So kind of off that, that last point, and I, I'm sorry, John, we're asking you a lot of questions that require some more clairvoyance than maybe you have access to at this point. But um, I was wondering kind of as far as mental fragility or resilience, right, what kind of time horizons um, change the way we react to stressors like this? Um, because I'm thinking, you know, if we're in quarantine for a month, then I don't think really anything changes. But if we're in quarantine for a year, do we start to significantly change norms and hygiene practices and mm -hmm. those types of things? Yeah. Okay. That, okay. So you're, so the time horizon, so let's talk about different kinds of change. So w one kind of change, the, the, the main kind of change we're talking about here is um, changes in your automatic mental processes. So many of you have taken a psychology course. If you remember behaviorism, you know, you give rewards and punishments. And so you can't train an animal, you know, just in a, well, actually, okay. BF Skinner can train a pigeon in five minutes. Actually, you can with operating condition. You can actually get behavior change pretty quickly. Um, but in, in a lot of my books, I talk about the mind is divided like a rider on an elephant. The rider is our conscious reasoning. The elephant is the automatic processes. So that does tend to take, you know, a month or two um, to, uh, you know, to change habits that stick. So we're talking several months. Um, but there can be changes that happen in an instant, and those are those epiphanies that, that Kyle was asking me to, to remember. There are epiphanies, there are drug experiences, um, there are uh, spontaneous peak experiences, uh, there are moments of trauma, and there are moments of, of joy and awe. So changes can happen. Um, changes can happen quickly. They also can happen in, um, um, in the stories that we tell. So the story that you, we each have our own personal narrative and um, all of you now have a major obstacle in your personal narrative. Not all, I mean, maybe some of you are fine with all of this, but um, certainly your job prospects are, are, are darker now than they were a few months ago. Um, so the story that you tell about yourself, that can change permanently and that can change pretty quickly. And so I just wanna share, here's just, here's just one thought. I was, something I was thinking this morning. Um, studies of happiness used to, people used to think happiness is the total number of minutes that you had happy. You added up over your life. If you had more minutes, you were happier. But that view was quickly abandoned because it turns out people don't just want the maximum happiness. They want a really good life story. And you tell me which you'd rather have. Um, here's, the, here's the story of my, of my parents' generation. My mother, for example, was born in 1931. Uh, in the depths of the depression. That's all she knew when she was a kid was the depression and then the war and the Holocaust. And then things got better and better and America had a glorious 20th century and my parents were, you know, they were born poor, but they were successful. And what, you know, everything, you know, what an amazing, amazing story. And as my mother was dying in 2017, um, she was very aware that it, as she saw it, the country was going to hell. And a lot of the things that, that, um, you know, that we loved about America. I mean, she taught me, my mother told me, America is the promised land for the Jews. It's not Israel, it's America. And my mother raised me to be very patriotic. Um, and as she, what she saw happening as she was dying um, was, was she, in, in a tragic story, she thought. Um, now compare that to your story. Um, many of you, I guess some of you remember the financial crisis, but it probably didn't matter much to you when you were kids. 
And then the 2010s kind of sucked. I mean, like this was a really bad decade and it's getting, you know, and now it's really, really, I mean, it ends with a pandemic. You can't, you know, you can't make this stuff up. So you have this incredible obstacle. You have this, all this bad stuff in your childhood. Your expectations have been brought way down. Now, odds are, odds are things are going to get a lot better. You know, just if you're depressed, read Steven Pinker, read, um, uh, read Matt Ridley, the rational optimist. Um, it's always been wrong to bet against America. It's always been wrong to bet against humanity. We're going to get through this and, and things might get worse, but then they're going to get better. So at least you might end up having a fantastic life story and national story. So, um, you know, I just think about it. Yeah, I just think about it that way, that there's all, your question was actually about change. And I kind of went off on this, like the thought that I was just, th but, but uh, don't just think about like yourself as a behaviorist creature, which you are, you're also a meaning making creature and you're part of a generation that is doing meaning making. And so if you don't get bitter, so it's possible that your generation will just get, you know, bitter and we're victims and we never got a chance. And, um, you know, that would be a, a story that would be self handicapping. Um, but if you're the generation that comes together to solve these problems and to say enough is enough, we've got to fix our institutions, we've got to have a better safety net, we've got to have more opportunity, you know, whatever it is, if you're the generation that does that, what a glorious life. Cool. Thank you. John, I'm going to throw a free IC question here just to change pace a little bit. Okay. Um, the question I have for you is, what is something you hate that you wish you loved and why? Oh, it's something I hate that I wish I loved. Well, that's, that's easy. It would be classical music because my, my wife loves classical music and she invites me to concerts at Carnegie Hall. And she finally has you know, realized that I was just kind of like, you know, pretending to not be bored out of my mind. And, and it would really help our marriage if I liked classical music. And it would also make me look more intelligent. Uh, so I wish I wish I liked it. I like some. There are some things. Okay, I remember. So you know, great college experiences. Like you know, I, for some reason I just audited a classical music class at Yale and Beethoven Seventh. Like I'd never heard of it, but the you know the professor put it on in this big auditorium with loud speakers, and like that was where I remember that to this day. Like that was a, one of the great moments in my college college education. Wonderful. I wouldn't have guessed that you hated classical music, but good to know. Well, yeah, you know, especially when there's like just like lots of silence. You're like, like, where are the notes? Like, what's happening? <laughs> um, question for you from Facebook from Mark Urista. You've spoken extensively about the impact of social media and screen time on Gen Z. What kind of impact do you think the expansion of online classes will have yeah. on college students? Yeah. Oh, at first, hi, Mark. Glad, glad to hear you're on the call. Um, um, what, let's see, what, okay, so the online, that's a good question. So first, you know, it is possible that social media is changing. Actually, this is something, okay, I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask the group here whether social media is changing in your experience during this. So let's, I'll just focus on the, um, the question about online courses. Uh, it's one of those things that could go either way. One thing that I and everybody else, uh, many of us who are professors fear is that um, the economics of higher ed was already in, in bad shape and we were very dependent on Chinese exchange, uh, students and foreign students uh, to keep enrollments up and, and to pay full fare. And if students now get even more adept at learning on their own and they discover, hey, you know, between Khan Academy and Coursera, uh, you know, why bother? Um, coming to campus, you know, I suppose, okay, I can be afraid of that as a professor, that would be selfish. So um, it's possible that there will be a lot more independent learning. That could be great, actually. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, let's see, that would be the, the, the uh, what would be bad? Um, it's, all, it's also possible that people will that all, okay, that this could be a real wake up call. In fact, we just had this conversation in my department. It was, okay, um, given that we all now see that we can do this online and it's not as good, it's, none of us like it as much, um, but this really puts the pressure on us to now like, okay, how do you really take maximum advantage of our time, our, of our time interacting? Uh, and, and so we, we're gonna try to learn to do less lecturing and more real, actually more 
intelligent conversation. Um, so I think this is going to be valuable as a real kick, like question what you're doing um, uh, and, and really try to make the most of the online format and then make the most when you're together in the classroom. So I think some good will come of it. But Mark, what, what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know that Mark's on the Facebook chat, so we'll give him a little bit time to, to, to give answer, or to answer that. And the oh, meeting. I see. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. here. Can awesome. you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, John. Good to see you. You too. Um, my biggest concern is about the social interaction. Um, I've discovered, as I'm sure you have over your many years of teaching, that learning very rarely occurs in isolation. And I know the social interaction typically increases engagement at my community college. Yeah. And I'm concerned that we're just not seeing that at the same levels that we typically do in the classroom. And to be frank, I think that the students that I have in my classes right now just aren't learning as much as they did when we were face to face. Okay. I, yes, I see that. I think you're probably right that that is happening. So this is a perfect chance for us to kick, us, kick this back to the current college students who are on here. Um, so one thing I remember, um, it was a Canadian student emailed me something after reading The Colony of the American Mind, and he said, um, you know, I come into class and we're all on our phones waiting for the professor to start. We don't talk to each other. We sit there on our phones. Mm -hmm. And I hear this a lot. And, and this has always been true that student, you know, and this is actually a, a, a nice demonstration to do you, you, in a class. You say, do you, do you feel that you want to have more contact? You want to reach, have more conversations with, with your, the people sitting around you or, or, you know, or not? And what do you think they want? Well, it turns out almost everybody's craving more interaction. And I think that's even more true now for Gen Z. So I think you're right to worry about that. So let me ask the, 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 stu the current college students here. First of all, um, do you think it's true that when you're on campus, people are not connecting enough? There, there's a, a reluctance to talk or to, or to meet. Everybody's on their phones. Uh, that's the first question. Actually, wait, can we do voting here? Can we do a uh, oh, reaction? Wait, is that, how do we do that? No, it's not reactions. We can, can do yes and no. Okay, yeah, can you, um, May, oh, let's, let's try it. If you can, whoever's running the poll, running it, can just do a poll here. So overall, so here's the first question for you. Um, overall, do you think that um, co college students on campus wish that they could have a lot more interaction? Um, they're, they're, they're shy or they're limited. They, wa they want more direct interaction. So say yes or no. And wait, how do you respond to that? Is it under the... I don't see where I would respond yeah. to that. Nine. Oh, it's owned to participants. Got it. Yeah, it's, it's participants. Yeses. Ten, yeses. Nine, 10 yeses and, and zero noes. Yep. Okay. Um, now, what do you think is happening now that everybody is remote? Um, do you think that there's even more? Cra well, that's kind of an obvious question, I guess. Although, although I guess people are. I don't, okay, well, no, it's not because Gen Z is comfortable connecting electronically. Um, overall, do you think that people feel more isolated um, or less? Just current college students. Yes for more isolated, no for less. That's right. Okay. Yes, everybody's saying yes. Okay. So, uh, so yes, Mark, I think this is a problem. And I think you're right that it, I was just thinking about like the loneliness and the mental health effects. You're talking about the learning effects. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and my God, I see it with my kids. My kids are 10 and 13, they're New York City public schools. You know, they have like an hour of stuff online, um, but it's very hard for them to like learn just on their own when they're not, you know, when they're just alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Next question is for Noah, who has his hand raised here. Uh, Noah, can you go ahead and unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Great. Hi, John. Uh, my name is Noah Jeanette. I'm the vice president of uh, the University of Pittsburgh chapter okay. of Bridge. And uh, my question is, one of the things I've noticed a lot on my campus is, and with dealing with people both in the classroom and in kind of, you know, extracurricular discussions about, you know, religion or politics or, you know, these kind of sensitive issues is this kind of sense of apathy that's kind of in some ways related to identity. Mm -hmm. Like people will not want to talk about certain things because they assume that because of the group they're in, 
that they shouldn't talk about them, whether that comes from a religious perspective, a racial perspective, gender, you know, whatever it is. And, but at the same time, people seem frustrated that these conversations aren't happening and then get, like, I think what you were kind of mentioned earlier is a little bitter, right, about the kind of, you know, the environment that they're in and then just refuse to engage even more and just kind of get into a vicious cycle yeah. of apathy where they just kind of retract from the conversation to a greater and greater degree and get more and more disillusioned. So I was wondering if you had any uh, comments or strategies on kind of like mm -hmm. how to break that kind of cycle of apathy and how to get people, you know, more engaged and stop from kind yeah. of regressing. Okay, well, so first I'd ask you, let's, let's diagnose this precisely if we can. Is it apathy, maybe they just don't care? Or is it fear that they will be, you know, humiliated or attacked or called racist or sexist or something? So is it, is it apathy? Is it fear? What exactly is, is holding them back? Or is it something else? Um, I would say that it probably depends on the person, but I think it's a little bit of both, right? Like they don't want to be judged, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there's, there maybe apathy isn't quite the right word. Maybe it's disillusionment, right? That they okay. don't think that it yeah. will, you know, that it, what they have to say or that their opinion really matters or that it'll really change anything that's worth having that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. Disillusionment, maybe some bitterness. And I, I do see this. I do see this. I see it. Uh, I see it sometimes in African American students who are just tired of having to say the same things over and explain the same things over and again. I see it in, in white boys, especially the white males like in high school, uh, who I've spoken to a number of private schools. And they say like, you know, we're blamed for everything. We're told we're bad. Everybody else is good. We're bad. And that I think actually makes them recruitable by, by, you know, Nazi groups even. Um, so I do see that a lot of people and we see, oh, we, on, and the CES on the campus expression survey. One thing we learned is that uh, I think conservative women uh, and conservative African-Americans, I think both were really reluctant to speak up because if they actually gave their views, they would be attacked by, you know, the sort of the politically different members of their identity group. So there are a lot of different reasons why people feel bitter from, from long bad experience of being attacked. And bad is stronger than good. So being attacked or shamed publicly once or twice uh, is going to change your behavior in a way that having a great conversation five times, you know, maybe they, maybe they would balance out, maybe not even. So it's, it's hard. Uh, we do have to change norms. Um, uh, I think that like the, one of the master skills, okay, here's what I, I know. Actually, no, we're not, we, we have, what time do we end? We have, we still have a uh, half hour. Is that right? What time do we end? About a half hour. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. So um, um, one of the, so let me, one of the most important skills that I can recommend to, to, to your generation, uh, to people who are going to be applying for jobs is the ability to, um, to be forgiving, easygoing, charitable, give people the benefit of the doubt. This is a truly employable skill. And where I'm coming from on this is this. Um, uh, I've, you know, I, I'm in a business school. I'm, I, I talk to a lot of people in business. And in the last year or two, since Gen Z has been um, on the job market and entering the corporate world, um, people are telling me things like, what the hell is happening? It's like some of, some of them come in looking for conflict or it's like somebody said something and now it's weeks of, of, you know, weeks of turmoil because somebody told a joke or wore a t-shirt, like what the hell is happening? And um, so I think employers are getting very frustrated with the moralism, not of the majority of you, but of, you know, of the, I mean, it's in the Hidden Tribe study, I think it's the, the progressive activists are the ones that we see on campus, but they're also right-wing activists as well. At any rate, um, your generation is getting a, a, um, a reputation for being more difficult to work with. Now, the millennials, we all made fun of for being, you know, so into craft brews and coffees and, you know, certain lifestyle things, but that was like normal intergenerational teasing. Um, Gen Z is seen as a problem to employ. 
and it's the anxiety and it's the quick judge the the freaking out thing over language so the more you cultivate this ability this magic ability you know that that Kyle has that you know that 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 bridge USAT the more you call this this magic ability to just talk to anyone and not react not get upset but have you bring an attitude of you know I actually want to learn like I, I want to hear from you employers are going to see it and say wow yeah this person is going to actually add value to, to our group not not take it away so um, I totally hear you on the degree to which a lot of people are exhausted or bitter, um, but just keep at it. Don't get bitter yourself. Develop these skills. Um, read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, do, go to openmindplatform.org. Do the Open Mind Platform. Do you, in Bridge USA, do you guys use Open Mind? Okay. Okay, yeah, some of you do. So yeah, I urge you to try it in all your chapters. Um, keep cultivating the skills that you're doing. They are not just, and they're not just employable, they're actually what the country most needs. They're, they're, morally, um, they're morally desperately needed. Now, does that answer your question or do you have any comment back? Um, yeah, I think that, that gets the gist of it uh, pretty well. So would you kind of characterize it as a kind of um, almost like compassionate dialogue then? I I guess I would I would characterize it as as coming first from a place of moral and intellectual humility, where you realize that you don't know that you don't know what you, you don't know what the truth is. And you certainly don't know everything, and you know I think one thing we're learning, even in the especially in the sciences, is that the truth is a lot harder to get than we thought even ten years ago. Like mm -hmm. when I was in grad school, we learned correlational studies are often garbage. But an experiment, you know, if it's a controlled experiment, then you know, you know causality. Turns out that's not true. Turns out even with experiments, we, we often don't know, we're often wrong. And so I think it, it starts from, from, from that kind of place and a mindset that says, um, my goal is not to beat people in petty squabbles. My goal is to learn as much as I can and make myself better and stronger and wiser. And if you come with that mindset, um, then you, it just changes the way you interact with, with people. So I think that's the, that's the starting point is the mindset that you bring. Great answer. Uh, Emily, you've had your virtual hand raised for a long time. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, um, my question kind of had um, to do with how maybe Gen Z living through the 2008 recession mm -hmm. and now graduating into a recession, how this is going to affect our generation's outlook on how we view working in America, whether yeah. we take on more jobs that maybe <clears throat> more of our personal passions, take a pay cut to pursue, to pursue those because we have lost hope in having economic stability in our lifetime, or think you'll see more influence into more secure, um, financially secure positions, just because I know um, a lot of my friends have had parents lose their jobs twice now. Um, so I'm just curious about that and what you think. Yeah. Well, I think we can look to the World Value Survey for some guidance. So if you just Google World Value Survey, some of you may have heard of it, it's this giant survey done in, it's now up to 100 countries every seven years since the 1990s, I think, or 80s. Um, and what, what they've learned is that as countries become, um, as countries become prosperous, basically if, if you're safe and prosperous, if you remove existential threats, you don't have to worry about finding food you know, next week, um, values shift in only one direction. Uh, values in all these countries, and so like take you know Korea or any of the any of the countries that like made it from poverty to you know upper middle class in a you know in a generation or two, the, the, the values all move the same way. The next generation cares more about um, women's rights, human rights, gay rights, environment, animal rights, self fulfillment. Uh, they have what are called what are the values called self expressive values, and so that actually in a sense reached its peak with the millennials. 
jobs, the millennials really had self-expressive values and they weren't going to put in their time and work hard for five years to, you know, to get to where they want to be like, no, I, I want this, you know, this job must express my values all the time. Um, and so I think we reached our, it's the peak with the millennials and even before the pandemic, um, brand, you know, brand, met, you know, companies that are do marketing were trying to understand Gen Z and they were already saying Gen Z wants more security uh, raised, uh, you know, raised, you know, with the financial crisis and not the, not quite the, um, the expectations. <clears throat> so given, uh, and I don't know if it's from, um, from the economic situation or from the higher levels of anxiety, I don't know what, you know, um, um, but given the anxiety levels that were already there, um, my guess is we might see a shift backwards on this dimension. Um, the only place we've seen that before is in Eastern Europe and Russia. In Eastern Europe and Russia, they had such economic catastrophe for 20 years that you actually saw values moving in a retrograde way in that sense. Um, now, I'm not, it's not gonna, you know, this is not gonna go on for 10 or 20 years here, I don't think. I'm, I'm pretty confident it's not gonna go on that long. But I think we might see a shift away from like the total self-expressive to like, I can't take things for granted. I need to have, a, you know, I need to have a secure job. I, I you know, I, um, so I think it is gonna, I, you're, I think you're right to see it as a one-two punch. Um, I think that is going to make your generation more realistic. Now that could end up giving us something more like a greatest generation because it's the generation that lived through the depression. They were the ones who were the greatest social capitalists in, in the last hundred years. And by that, I mean, this is Robert, I think Robert Putnam used the term, Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone. The people who created social capital, the people who joined groups, invested in their communities, put, you know, they, they didn't put themselves first. Um, it was a beautiful generation. And the depression and the war are credited as being the cause of their pro-social tendencies. So yeah, it's gonna affect you and you're probably gonna expect a lot less from work. Um, and that could, I don't know, that could in the long run be good. It could make you better citizens than, than you know, my generation has been. It could have all kinds of effects, but I don't know. That, those are just my thoughts. One of you said that you're asking me to prognosticate. It's, it's very hard to, you know, uh, was Yogi Berra said, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future or something like that. Um, but I can at least tell you, here are some psychological processes that are likely to be activated. That's all I can do. Got it. John, John, change of pace. I got two free IC questions for you. First okay. one is, if you could meet anyone, any person, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh, dead or alive. Wow. Um, well, let's see. My first thoughts this is kind of geeky, but my first thoughts are David Hume and Adam Smith, because they are um, they are the sort of the first people who, um, you know, I mean, like I like just like I would say Darwin, you know, because like he's like the first person who saw evolution and you know gave us this you know expanded our our thinking. And my next book is going to be about capitalism and the moral base, the moral foundations of capitalism, and. Uh, so um, Adam Smith and David were just the most brilliant philosophers uh, and useful philosophers, really relevant to our, our day and age. So that's my geeky answer. But, um, you know, there's, I mean, you know, I'd love to, I also like, you know, I'd love to, see, you know, see whether Jesus existed and Moses and like, you know, to meet these people uh, if they, you know. So um, I, I love history. I, I went through a Rome phase. I picked up, I picked up um, some cassette tapes when I was teaching at the University of Virginia to, on a long drive, and I listened to Edward Gibbons to decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And for a year or two, I was obsessed with ancient Rome. And so I would have loved to meet, uh, you know, Mark, um, well, Marcus Aurelius for sure. Um, anyway, those are some great thoughts. Answers. Not, not terrible. Great answers. Um, My next question for you, John, is what have you given up on? What have I given up on? Wow. Let's see. What have I given up on? Uh, I've, I've given up on doing things that are exciting but risky. So um, I've given up on things like ever riding a motorcycle again or, or skydiving. I, I'm an awe junkie. I love experiences of awe. And 
and I've always sought them out. And I sometimes took risks that could have killed me. And then once you get married and once you have kids, then you kind of get much more, you know, much more like, okay, no more risk. So I've given up on those things, but that's not quite what you meant. What have I given up on? Um, uh, I, I go through times, I go through moments when I give up on America. Um, when I, I look at the trends and I think this just isn't going to work, uh, but those are temporary. Um, and it's really just like, you know, I'll see some story or sometimes I'll, I'll just, you know, sometimes I get kind of depressed about it. Um, but you know, then you read history and you see how bad things were in the, you know, the 1820s and, you know, 1968, my God, you want to, you know, you want to appreciate our time. Wait, there's a, Oh, there's a there's a video. Somebody did a video collage. How do we find it? 1968 video. Oh shoot! I'll see if I can put. I'll send it. Uh, uh, 1968 video. Somebody did it. You know, because that was this incredible year of political agitation and violence, and there were bomb. You know, multiple bombings a week, every week in America. Uh, so you see what we've been through before. The you know the Civil War. So I sometimes give up on America, but it's temporary. Good answer. So I'm going to pull a question from Facebook. Uh, we have Elizabeth Jennings who asked, how do you respond to others shutting down controversial issues by using the virus? I.e., how dare you bring that up when people are dying in the hospital, etc. How uh, do you not let previous concerns get buried on purpose under this new situation? Hmm. Interesting. I guess, um, huh. So I guess yeah, I see conversations as uh, people make a, a gambit or a bid. And just because somebody makes a bid to define what's going on doesn't mean you have to accept it. So you have to use your judgment about whether you think others around will accept that bid. Um, and if so, then maybe you should shut up temporarily. Maybe it is inappropriate right now. Um, but there are a lot of people who are displaying and, and this is especially the problem with social media and with the generation raised on social media is is there's much more inauthentic social manipulation um so i, so I think a kind of a gentle a gentle question a gentle redefining uh, and saying you know you know I, I i mean no disrespect but you know we uh, if we're going to make it through as a country we we have to still have you know forms of civil discourse um that's kind of a that's i mean i don't i don't know exactly what to say there but i would say um see people's moves as as a bid and then you have the power to question whether that bid is appropriate don't just accept other people's bids and you see this and because what you get is called preference falsification so on social media one person tries to define like this as a, you know, this is an act of racism or this is an act of whatever. And a lot of people, most people might be thinking, uh, no, it isn't, but nobody says anything. And if so, then the bid goes through and then everybody learns, oh, okay, I guess that was. Um, so I would, I would say just again, develop these like super duper social skills by joining free intelligent conversation and by joining Bridge USA and by engaging in it frequently, and that you can do it with grace. That's the that's the challenge. Do it, you know, like defuse a bomb with grace. I did not pay him to say that. Um, Scott, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, I was curious going back to a question asked earlier about. Uh, whether or not you see the follow-up to the situation with uh, COVID-19 resulting in uh, further continuous divide or people coming together. Under the assumption that, uh, say, say people do come together and we really start to work together again for however long, how enduring do you expect that to be if that does happen. Yeah. So there is research on the effect of war and foreign attack. And generally that produces a profound and long-lasting increases in trust, 
research by my friend and colleague Joe Henrik. They looked at uh, country in Africa. They looked at Georgia in this, you know, Soviet ex republic where there was war. Uh, when it happened, when kids were teenagers or young, they were they they uh, were more trusting for the rest of their lives. Where they were, and that was again like the greatest generation thing. So war or foreign attack has powerful, long lasting, positive effects on group solidarity. That's clear. A pandemic. You're afraid of each other. Uh, we evolved to be afraid of disease. Um, there are sometimes shortages. We started with a toilet paper shortage. Apparently in a few weeks, we'll have a meat shortage. So these things bode badly. These things suggest that we may not come together. On the other hand, on the other hand, I think the overwhelming response on the ground around America is to be more cooperative, people helping. So in these early stages, I think the positive is greatly outweighing the negative. Now, um, in, in Britain, I think they're gonna have a very good pandemic because they went through this incredibly divisive Brexit divide, which was not straight Tory uh, labor, at, but uh, so it scrambled things. And now they have this pandemic to sort of put them back together and they have a queen and there's research showing that constitutional monarchies are more stable than republics because you have a head of state who is above politics. And if you want to see a beautiful leadership speech, watch Queen Elizabeth's speech to the nation about the virus. So I think Britain is going to have a big net increase in social capital. America is going to be a lot more complicated. Um, at the national level, we're, at the presidential level, we're much more divided. We have this big election coming up. So a few weeks ago, I was optimistic. Now I'm back towards pessimistic, but that's at the national level. Within companies, within schools, within towns, I think we're still going to see a lot of, a lot of coming together, um, a lot of desire for that. So I think America is going to have a very mixed pandemic, and it's going to be much more local and patchwork. Uh, the country as a whole may be worse off, but you can, you can make the places you're in good leadership, a good citizenship can create pockets of, of, of a lot of positivity. But what do you guys think? I'd love to hear, does anyone have a different opinion? What do you think is gonna, is gonna happen as the, the long-term effect of this on our, on our society and our civility? Any thoughts? Um, I, I guess I, I've, I've seen several uh, situations, uh, especially regarding uh, the development of a vaccine uh, and the conversation around uh, women's rights to choice and whatnot where both both uh, far sides have kind of bashed the other about going back on their previous uh, beliefs on the right to choice and, and whatnot and people making parallels in that case. And there, there's sort of a paradox in that case. Obviously they're not one-to-one, -one. they can't really be compared uh, in, in, in entirety, but the, the, um, I, I, I think it introduces the I, idea that those situations aren't as, uh, simple as we generally have approached them up to this point and that there is a paradox and that there is more reason for us to, uh, come together and, and actually kind of talk about these and reason through them beyond just what do you believe oh not what i believe okay we're against each other right. kind of thing yeah and so that that gives well well it is kind of uh initially forming into the these like little petty arguments from what i've seen uh i think it offers the opportunity to kind of be like all right there, there there's clearly something that's mismatched because both sides are having uh, having to sort of shift their their perspective a little bit, and they're being forced to acknowledge that. And I, mm -hmm. I think that might offer an opportunity to bring people together. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're gonna have to wait. There, you know, the, we'll have to rely on poll on on good polling to know because we're all in our homes. All we can see is what we see on our screens. And so, if you're paying attention to social media, yeah, things look really bad. But um, that first poll done by More in Common showed that in general, this was, it was, the data was collected like two weeks ago. In general, Americans felt 
so what, one of the key questions was, do you feel that we're all in this together or that, um, I forget what the opposite was, but it was a pretty strong majority of both Republicans and Democrats were saying, yeah, we're all in this together. And that might not last, but, but don't, be, don't be discouraged by what you see on social media. Always remember that, that, is, that social media handed a gigantic megaphone to the extremes. And that's one of the problems in our democracy. Wonderful. I'm going to move to the next question here. Kyle Taylor has his hand raised. Please unmute yourself and, and um, ask your question. Hey, John. Thanks for being with your, uh, being with us uh, this evening and talking with us. Um, I have a question about your book, um, The Righteous Mind, where you talk about how conservatives actually have a better understanding of how liberals uh, think and how they're, where they're coming from versus liberals uh, knowing where conservatives come from because of universities, which are largely tilted to the left, um, conservatives are more exposed and more challenged by liberal views yeah. and liberals have a kind of deficit in this challenge. Yep. So do you see any like solutions going forward in universities and how to cure this deficit? Um, well, I would say Bridge USA and Free Intelligent Conversations and Heterodox Academy. Um, the, um, yeah, the basic finding uh, is that, uh, the, the basic finding that, that uh, Kyle's referring to is a study I did where Jesse Graham was the lead author. And we had people fill out the Moral Foundations questionnaire. If you go to yourmorals.org and one third were told, fill it out. Uh, one third were told, pretend that you were a conservative. How would you fill it out? One third were told, pretend you're a progressive or liberal. How would you fill it out? And so then we actually, so we actually just see who's able to pretend to be the other side. What we found is that um, centrists and center right were the most accurate uh, people who said they're very liberal were the least accurate by a lot. They could not pretend to be a conservative. Um, and you see this a lot that, um, that, you know, people who are progressive tend to be in creative industries and in cities. And so it's easy to, you know, it's easy to go your whole life without really being exposed to conservative ideas. Whereas if you're a conservative, unless you have homeschooled your kids in a cave, you can't, you know, you, 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 you encounter progressive ideas, you encounter progressive media, movies, news. So this gives the right a structural advantage, uh, not just in our democracy, in Europe as well. Um, you rarely hear of an election in which, oh, surprise, the left did so much better than was expected. But it's often the case that the right does better than expected because um, the left just has a lot of trouble understanding or imagining the other side. So, you know, my view, uh, something I tried to say when I was running Heterodox Academy, um, is that if, you know, if you're a partisan left person and you, and you, what you want is ultimate, you know, ultimately to be successful politically, you should want viewpoint diversity because it's going to make your people smarter. Um, and I urge you all to watch this with a wonderful Van Jones video that I show every chance I get. Uh, if you just, if you Google Van Jones, excellent metaphors, it's a brilliant, brilliant three minute talk at the University of Chicago on, um, uh, he says, I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I want you to be strong. And he talks about how he wants college students to engage with their opponents. You know, anyway, um, so it would seem to be in, their, in, in, you know, in, in progressive people's self-interest to push themselves and younger, you know, younger progressives to engage it would make them more effective politically. Uh, but as you know, from the righteous mind, we're not really rationally pursuing our long-term self-interest. We're much more concerned about what people think of us now and not everybody, but key people. So we're much more interested in showing off what a great team member we are, even if that hurts our team. Wonderful. Um, I'm gonna, Jessica, have your virtual hand raised for quite some time. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, oh, hello, I think Jessica. The question actually goes off a little bit of Scott's, but I had a question kind of surrounding coronavirus. Is for Gen Z, we've seen our parents like lose their jobs or possibly lose their jobs twice now, back in 2008 and then now. Um, when this first stimulus package was passed a couple weeks ago, they forgot like a lot of college students that were claimed by their parents. And then one of the big things leading up for this election was a lot of talk about like um, healthcare reform and all of that, um, which kind of, I think 
we're being faced with now where it's like, oh my gosh, we do need something to kind of change. My question is, do you think that Gen Z, because of like all of these um, and other ones, will make decisions going forward out of anger or with the intent of like working together and finding a common solution? Oh, that's a great question. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just share my, you know, I have, a, I have limited exposure to Gen Z and that I, at, at NYU I teach mostly MBA students. And I've met, you know, I've been speaking about the book, so I've spoken with, and I, you know, every place I go, I'll, you know, I have lunch with students and, and uh, have meetings with them. Uh, and my own kids are Gen Z, but they're younger, they're 10 and 13. And <clears throat> so let me just share my thought. You tell me if you think this is right. Um, that overall, I'd say um, Gen Z seems um, uh, really um, sweet and um, not angry, uh, more anxious, and not at all in denial. Um, that is, I've always found that when I, I give a talk and I say, here's what I think happened, and here are the mental health things, and here's the overprotection, and, um, and it's a kind of an unflattering picture. There's no blame, but it is an unflattering picture. And then I say, you know, do you think this was basically right or wrong? And 100% of the Gen Z students say, yes, this was right. Like, this is, this is what's happened to our generation. So my sense is that Gen Z is not in denial, not, not angry, um, um, anxious, a little confused about the future, uh, but wanting to do better and wanting to get stronger and wanting to learn and wanting to reach out and wanting to to, to grow and flower and be successful. So, so I actually have a lot of hope and I don't see them being a revolutionary generation full of anger. Now, there's, we've seen the activists on campus, though that is a, there, there are, of course. Um, so, but, um, and then obviously, you know, again, you know, there's, you know, the extremists on both sides are active and then each side has its own pathologies. They're not symmetrical. Um, but, um, so uh, that's my thought, just more from what I've seen like on campuses. But you tell me, do you think they're going to react with anger, with resignation, or with sort of pragmatism and like, you know, buckle down and fix this? What do you think? Honestly, I'm not really sure. Just because I know um, somebody, maybe it was you were mentioning social media earlier, like there's a lot of um, it's kind of like a different world on social media where I in my opinion, I kind of take that as people are more angry at the other side for not understanding them. So it's kind of like I could see where decisions would be made going forward to out of spite, I think. Um, however, like all of my involvement, because I'm at the Bridge um, USA at ASU chapter, mm -hmm. um, it kind of gives me like a lot of hope, I think. Um, because there are so many people willing to listen to each other and um, understand. So I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. If you compare it to the, you know, the baby boomers in the 60s, I was born in 1963, so I have no, no recollection of the hippie era. Um, but, you know, there was, again, a lot of violence, like people planned, ter there were terrorist groups, there were kidnappings, murders. Um, there was, you know, the thought was armed revolution. We must have armed revolution. And there's no hint of that today that I see. So, um, you know, however bad things are socially, you know, at least violence has come way, way, way down, as Steve Pinker pointed out long, is for a long time, way, way, way down. And now as things are getting worse, it's not really going up. So, you know, that is something to be hopeful about. I think we have time. Maybe we'll do three questions here, right? Um, I see Trevor has his hand raised. Uh, Trevor, you can unmute your mic and get and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask quickly, um, how do you think you should go about, uh, as a lot of us are entering the workforce um, with a lot of things on social media, such as like cancel culture, to express sometimes controversial opinions with the fear of losing our job or having other external social repercussions that we um, can account for? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, you know, I think, um, you know, it's kind of weird that throughout my life, we've removed all these risks. We've removed, you know, you're not going to like step in a pothole and fall down into a giant hole. Like whereas in, in, in developing countries I've been in, that can happen. Um, but, you know, we've removed all these risks. 
is physical risk, but yet, you know, you guys can destroy your lives with one careless tweet or, or somebody can destroy it for you without you even doing anything wrong. So, um, you know, I think in general, you're probably best advised to just stay off as much as you can um, and, you know, see it as a, you know, snake pit and a cesspool for the most part. Um, the platforms are different. That's not true of all the platforms. Um, but I would certainly say, you know, be careful, be wary of it. Um, now, it does also offer oper lots of opportunities to do positive things, lots of opportunities to celebrate people and, and, and you know, and praise them and, and do nice things. So I, I, um, I'm no master at, at that. I try to do that sometimes on Twitter, but you know, Twitter's the worst of them all overall. So I don't have, you know, don't look to me for overall advice on, on how to be skillful on social media, except to say, be really careful. And social media is really a good reason to read the Stoics and the Buddhists because um, it's, you know, it's hard enough to go through life as a human being with all these, you know, people say things about you, bad things happen. Well, now with social media, that can happen 10 times or 50 times as much as it used to. And so I think um, developing some inner calmness, uh, some distant ability to distance yourself from petty squabbles, from stupid little things um, is, a, is a life skill. Mm. I guess I mean also in a sense of like, for example, Jeff Bezos says something personally and then a lot of people find it and attack him on social media and then like you have something like boycott Starbucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so these things I feel like can happen off of social media as well. Um, now that we have like a hyper connected culture. Uh, so I think that I, I yeah, if, that social yeah. media. if you're, you know, if you're famous, if you're rich, if you're in the public eye, then yes, you can't escape it. Um, but you know, but if not, then you can and just, you know, always remember, it's not just that it's not the real world, you know, it's its own world. And, you know, and there's debate on this. I mean, I have an article in the Atlantic from last November. Uh, if you just look up haywire democracy, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I lay out with Tobias Rose Stockwell exactly how social media changed to become an outrage machine, why I think it's so bad for democracy. And it was when I worked that out about a year ago that I, I cut my, my time on Twitter by about 80%. I'm, I'm rarely on it now. Thank you. Related, a related question that came from uh, Cody Ann Baker on Facebook. Uh, what are your suggestions for dealing with loved ones or friends who use social media as a cry for help, either by making belligerent posts espousing polarized views, making threats of withholding friendship from people who don't agree with them, or even threatening self-harm? Any tips for discerning between an, indiv an individual oh. who is genuinely crying for help versus an individual who is being emotionally and psychologically abusive? Oh man, that is an important question. And it's one that I have no expertise in. First, because I'm not a clinical psychologist. Second, because I'm not on Instagram or Facebook. I'm just a little bit on Twitter. So I'd hate to give advice on such an important question. Um, you know, except just to say that, the, I'm sorry, who's, who's the person who asked the question? What's her the name? Cody Ann Baker. C Cody, okay. Um, just that clearly, Cody recognizes that um, that this is that a lot of this is performance, and so how do you know, you know, when it's when it's real, when it's the performance? Ah, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Um, the the you know the the rates of depression are and anxiety are way up by self report, but they're also up for self harm and suicide. So it's not this isn't all performance. There is something really bad going on. Okay, I think we're at time, John. I'm gonna, I'm gonna conclude here with two free IC questions for you. The okay. first, if you could change anything about the way you were raised, what would it be? Anything about the way I was raised? Wow. <clears throat> um, I, gosh, that's hard because I think my mother did a great job. She was really skillful. My dad was much clumsier, um, but my mother was really good at, at making sure there were consequences for our behavior. Like one time she called me home from my friend's house. She called and said, you have to come home right away. I, well, what is it? What is it? And she just looked at the table and there was a box of ice, you know, a carton of ice cream on the table. She said, you left the ice cream on the table. So what? You called me home for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so my mother was incredibly skillful and I have no complaints, no suggestions for how she could have raised me better. Um, 
probably I would be better if I had more adversity in my childhood. I didn't have much. I was very lucky and I was, uh, you know, raised in upper middle class household with two married parents. Um, you know, they had a bad marriage, but I didn't always, didn't know it for a long time. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm just very grateful for the childhood that I had and for the skill, especially of my mother. So I don't know. Okay. Okay. Final question for you then, John, is what about the future absolutely excites you right now? What about it excites me? Um, what about it excites me? Um, okay. I'll tell you. Um, so every morning, okay, so I teach a positive psychology course at, at NYU and my co-teacher, Mira Devji, implemented this thing where we do the five-minute journal. Here, I've got it right here. Let me see if I have it. The five-minute journal. And uh, so here it is. I highly recommend it. It's wonderful. Um, every day, so here, every day you start, you fill out, uh, I am grateful for. And you say, you see, you know, you put three things that you're grateful for. Uh, and then what would make today great? And then at the end of the day, uh, you have you say three amazing things that happen. You sort of you reflect on what was good, you're counting your blessings. And by about a week into doing this, I realized something. And and I and I came up with a formulation that really okay, this was like kind of transformational. This was like a real insight. And this was just before the COVID thing hit, but um uh here here it is. On oh yeah, on February 9th, I first said. I am grateful for being alive here, that is in the USA and in New York City, and there's nowhere else I'd rather live. There's no other country I'd rather live in, and there's no other city I'd rather live in. Now, that is, uh, there's no other time I would rather be alive. I, I would not rather be alive in the 19th century or, you know, or, or any other time. Um, and with these people, when I th thought about my family and, and all the, the teachers I've had and all the people who contributed to my life. And, and I put that all together. And, I, and I, so I know it's something I write every morning. I say, I am grateful to be alive, that I have the chance to be alive here, now, and with these people. And so if you just think about how lucky we all are, like, yeah, things are worse now than they were a few months ago. But think about how lucky we are to have a chance at all on this earth and at a time of relative peace and prosperity and physical safety. I mean, you know, even with the death rates now, it's nothing compared to 100 years ago. So I guess um, something that really excites me is just the chance to be here. I How's think that for that is a wonderful that's a wonderful answer to end this on. I think um, I, I want to thank you for taking the time. I think we we learned today that one John is excited to be here. We've learned uh, don't invite him on a, a motorcycle ride or to or to skydive. I have, I have to say no. Yeah. We've learned don't invite him to a classical music concert either, yeah. and keep him away from record stores. But talk to him. <laughs> about <Adam Smith>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate everyone who tuned in. If you uh, all want to keep up with the organizations represented here that put this together, I just shared the screen where you can find uh, the websites and, and social links to keep up with. Um, hopefully, we get a chance to do this again. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and asking wonderful questions. John, if I could just say just one thing, especially for the current college students um, at Heterodox Academy, uh, we have a beautiful new website and we have all these groups that we've, that we've created. So if you go to the website, heterodoxacademy.org, and you, uh, you click on get involved, you'll see there's a link to groups. There's a HX university or HX undergrad or something. There's a, there's a group for current college students. Um, so you've got yeah, lots of options for, for groups to help you do more of what, what you want to do, what you're, what you're doing here. So thank you to uh, thank you to to uh, uh, Free Intelligent Conversation, to Bridge USA, uh, to my colleagues at Heterox Academy, and to all of you for joining the call. Everyone, stay safe. Have a wonderful evening and night wherever you are, and take care. Good night.